You know, I think that's why tribalism is so dangerous. Why thinking of people as groups is so dangerous. Because when that happens, you can hate people you've never even met. You can hate people simply for existing. You can hate people that have never done you any harm and want to harm them despite them never doing you any harm. And that's the point that Saul has reached here. That anybody that even doesn't hate David as much as me must be the enemy, and I must destroy them. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you made it all the way to the end, it must mean you like what you saw and should like and subscribe. That or you were just super bored, wound up here by accident, and were too lazy to turn the video off before now. Now, I hope you're the first type of person, but if you happen to be the second type, doesn't really matter to me, I got a view out of you either way. Huh. Profiting off of the laziness of others. This must be what it feels like to be a Democrat. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for The Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today comes from the book of 1 Samuel. We're going to be continuing our little series in 1 Samuel. And to get you caught up to speed on what's been happening while we were gone, Saul has now threatened his own men. That was what happened in the last passage that we looked at. Saul has essentially threatened his own men because he's so angry about the fact that David has been able to escape his grasp. So David's on the run, Saul is pursuing him, and Saul is now saying, ah, you guys are all against me, nobody's for me, I'm having to fight even my own troops when it comes to David, and he accuses them of disloyalty and basically threatens them if somebody doesn't come up with some information he can use to try to track David down. And there is one soldier that is within earshot of this named Doeg, who speaks up and tells Saul about the priest helping him. You remember that little episode that we just went through where the priest gave his men showbread and uh, because they, they needed something to eat and also gave David the sword of Goliath and so armed him and gave him food and then David slipped off and went on his merry way. So Doeg apparently found out about this and he tells Saul about it and so that's really where we start tonight in 1 Samuel 22, verses 12 through 19, which reads, Saul said, Listen now, son of Ahitub. And he replied, by the way, this is him talking to the priest here. Here I am, my lord. Saul then said to him, Why have you and the son of Jesse conspired against me, in that you have given him bread and a sword, and have inquired of God for him, so that he would rise up against me by lying in ambush as it is this day? Then Ahimelech, he's the priest, answered the king and said, And who among all of your servants is as faithful as David, the king's own son-in-law, who is commander over your bodyguard and is honored in your house? Did I just begin to inquire of God for him today? Far be it from me. Do not let the king impute anything against his servant or against any of the household of my father, because your servant knows nothing at all of this whole affair. But the king said, You shall certainly die, Ahimelech, and you and all of your father's household. And the king said to the guards who were attending him, Turn around and put these priests of the Lord to death, because their hand is also with David, and because they knew that he was fleeing and did not inform me. But the servants of the king were unwilling to reach out with their hands to attack the priest of the Lord. Then the king said to Doeg, you turn around and attack the priest. And Doeg the Edomite turned around and attacked the priest. And he killed on that day eighty-five men who wore the linen ephod. He also struck Nob, the city of the priest, with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and infants. He also struck oxen, donkeys, and sheep with the edge of the sword. A couple of really interesting things that jump out at me about this subject. Do you remember why the blessing was taken from Saul, why he is no longer king. If you remember, he was supposed to destroy the Agites. 
He was supposed to take them all down and destroy them utterly. But what happened is he kept the king, Agag. He hung on to him, didn't kill him, just brought him back as a prisoner. And he hung on to all the best livestock, didn't kill them either. So when God told him to do something, he decided, well, it's really kind of more of a guideline. But when this event happens, Saul takes to the city just because someone helped David. And remember, like the priest said in that passage, David is the king's son-in-law. He is the commander of his own bodyguard. He is a soldier for Israel, a member of Saul's forces. Any rational person would look at that and say, helping out David is the same as being loyal to Saul. Because that would make sense. I'm helping David, who is Saul's servant, and works as his own bodyguard, and is related to him by marriage. And yet, for this, Saul kills him, kills all the priests around him that also helped David, and killed people of the city that he was living in at the time. Took out women, children, infants, and utterly destroyed them. So he did to that city what God commanded him to do to God's enemies. Saul's paranoia and mania has reached a level that he feels justified in killing innocent women and children to get what he wants. And and not foreign, as bad as that would be. Not foreign women, not foreign people. Israelites, the very people that God has given him the responsibility of taking care of. So when God tells him to do something, oh, that's just too hard for me to do. But when I want to do exactly the same thing against my own people because it suits my desires and my goals, well, then all of a sudden he's more than willing to utterly destroy his own people. That's how far down this road of darkness Saul has gone. And the thing that's really sad here is that even his own people recognize that Saul has gone way too far here. Saul gives them an order, and and this is a military. Orders are pretty darn serious in a military setting. Saul, who is a king, not not just a general, but a king, has given them a direct order to do something, and they all stand around and go, uh, not me. They know that that can cost them their lives, and they are still so fearful of God's wrath. Probably not necessarily all that reputable people, but even they recognize You don't go attacking God's priests. And Saul doesn't get that. Saul has elevated himself above God. Think about that. When he desires something, or when it's his turn to take vengeance on people that he considers his enemies, even if they're not, that's perfectly justified and he doesn't hesitate for a second. When God says, these people are my enemies, you are my appointed king, you go take them out, Saul goes, eh. Saul has not just made himself equal with God, he has elevated himself past God in his own mind. If you want to know why Saul was unfit to be king, that's all the reason you need right there. He has completely abandoned any sense of reverence or subjugation to God's will. All he cares about is maintaining his own power. And he is willing to kill innocent people to do it. Not just David, but just people that may have helped David out or may have known about where David was and didn't inform him. Even though that David, at this point, is still his relative and a member of his own military. He still sees this as disloyalty worthy of death. You know the verse in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, where Jesus talks about being judged by the same measure by which you judge? Rest assured, this is what happened when Saul met his Creator. That this is the conversation that God had with Saul. 
when he died and, and was judged by him. That he's saying, you showed no mercy to people that did you no wrong. Why should I show mercy to you who deliberately disobeyed me and rebelled against me? And what's important and, and profound about that is, what's that conversation going to look like for us? How often, and I'm saying this because I'm guilty of it too, how often have we looked at the thing that we wanted and knew that it contradicted what God wanted and just said, yeah, we'll, we'll do the thing that we want. Yeah, that, that seems like a reasonable proposition to me, or even justified it in our own heads that what we wanted was justified, but what God wanted or what God commanded us to do, that's just a real heavy lift, and I just really want to, don't want to deal with it right now. How often has that been the case for us? Because I know in my life, I hate to admit it, but it's been pretty common. It has not been a terribly rare occurrence that I put what I want ahead of what God wants, and that I look at my desires as being more important than what God desires for me to do. But to put into context exactly what's going on here, the priest doing this, that defends himself, it seems that he did know that there was some conflict going on with David and Saul. But would he have really known that Saul would have considered, even in his wildest dreams, showing kindness to David, his general, arguably his top general, as being something that would have been a disloyalty to Saul himself? I mean, to, to help us understand it, this would be like a somebody showing kindness to um, General Eisenhower in World War II and FDR being very mad at them for helping out Eisenhower. Well, that doesn't make any sense. That guy's on your team. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't that be helping you too? But this is the logic that Saul has fallen into because of his mania and his own lust after power. But I think it's always important to ask why. Why would Saul do this? Were the priests a threat to him? Was he afraid that there was going to be some kind of priest rebellion where they come out against Saul? I don't think for a second that that's what Saul was concerned about. I don't. I think that the reason that Saul was concerned about this, the reason that Saul decided that this was the correct course of action, is because he is so incredibly power-hungry, he was sending out a message to everybody else. That if you ally yourself with David, you are putting yourself in my crosshairs. Anybody that helps David out, anybody that gives him aid or comfort, is considered an enemy of the state, and I will destroy them. That's why Saul did this. He wasn't afraid of the city being rebellious against him. I don't think that he believed that for a second. What he was afraid of was David, and David taking his crown. And because of that, he was fine with just killing innocent people as pawns in his political game to make sure that nobody else helped David outside of Israel. And we'll see in the subsequent passages, we won't go there yet, but we'll see in the subsequent passages because of this, what David does is hide his family outside of Israel. He wants to make sure they can't be used as leverage against him because now he's seen Saul's not only after me, he's after anybody that even helps me. And after that point, David hides outside of Israel so that nobody that he is, is living with and living amongst at the time is killed because of Saul. He no longer stays in Israel or with Israelites. They don't give him any aid after this point. He only works with people outside of Israel because that way Saul can't get to them, or at least not without a fight. It's really sad to see this situation, but this is really where we, we have reached in, the, in this part of the story. And I think that that's also a powerful warning to us too. Because Saul's hatred has now reached the point to where it's so powerful, it's transferable. That his hatred of David has so blinded him to everything else that he doesn't just hate David, he hates everybody associated with David. He hates everybody that might have been nice to David or helped to David. And I think that people in our day-to-day -day lives, with less drastic results, of course, 
that we kind of come to the same thing, don't we? Is this not a common thing with us that that we hate somebody and, and we can reach a point to where we hate them so much that we hate people around them, we hate their friends, we hate their family, we hate other people sort of in their orbit? We hate people and we hate that other people don't hate that person too. Honestly, I think a lot of the, the things that we have found ourselves in with tribalism and, and trying to create class struggle and race struggle in our country is because of that very principle. We hate some people that fit this demographic or this tribe or whatever, and because of that, we've transferred our hate to everybody in that group. I mean, that's what racism and tribalism is. It's hating one person or one particular part of that person, one aspect of them, and then sort of projecting that onto everybody else that shares that characteristic. You know, I think that's why tribalism is so dangerous. Why thinking of people as groups is so dangerous. Because when that happens, you can hate people you've never even met. You can hate people simply for existing. You can hate people that have never done you any harm and want to harm them despite them never doing you any harm. And that's the point that Saul has reached here. That anybody that even doesn't hate David as much as me must be the enemy, and I must destroy them. There's a lot of people that do this with politics today. There's a lot of people that take the stance, if you're not for me, you're against me. And if you're against me, I must destroy you. You are the enemy. And there's people that do it on the right and people that do it on the left. I mean, it, it's just the way that it is now. And it's sadly become our political reality. That if that's somebody that's a conservative, I have to hate them because I hate all conservatives. If that's somebody that's on the left, they must be trying to destroy this country and I must hate them because they're a liberal. I'm, I'm sorry, but there's nothing in the Bible that advocates for that. It advocates for certain things, and it advocates for us standing against evil when we see it crop up, but it never advocates for hurt, 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 sorry, hating people just because they belong to one specific group. In fact, it, it pretty often preaches against that. And I want you to think about that, because that's the inverse of tribalism, isn't it? If tribalism is projecting hatred onto other people, to where you can hate people you've never even met, God's way is the exact opposite. Love people you've never even met. Love everybody because they're all part of one group, the one group that God created, the human race. They're all my children. They all came from Adam. I formed each one of them in the womb individually. I know them. I love them. I gave my life for them. You do the same. That's what Christianity is. It is the ability to love a person that you've never met, that you have no association with, that you know nothing about, don't know their face, their name, anything. And you love them simply by virtue of being another one of God's children. Even if they're not a Christian, that love is supposed to be there because that's the love that Jesus Christ had for them when he died on a cross for their sins. That's the opposite of tribalism that you love everybody because we're all part of one tribe, God's children. Stay the course, friends. This is usually the part of the video where I ask you to like this video and subscribe to my show and click the notification bell. Does that guarantee you're going to get notifications when I post new content? Honestly, the way that YouTube censors conservatives, I really doubt it. But you know what liking and subscribing does do, for sure? It ticks off the dark cyber overlords at Google when they see those likes and subscriptions despite shadow banning my conservative content. So you really should like and subscribe, if nothing else, just to stick it to them.